Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. In this video, what we're going to do is talk about the macrolide antibiotics, how they work. Okay, so the macrolide antibiotics is a family of antibiotics that all have a certain chemical structure. Okay, and what we're going to see in this video is how they all work. Um, and they work basically by blocking protein synthesis. Uh, so they stop the cell from being able to produce more proteins. That means that they have a bacteriostatic effect. They are not bactericidal, um, they are bacteriostatic. Because if you stop a bacterial cell from making proteins, it already has all of the proteins that it already has made. Okay, and those proteins that it already has are enough for it to continue living. So stopping protein synthesis, which is what the macrolide antibiotics do, does not kill the cell. Okay, instead it just stops it from being able to divide because in order, if you are to divide into two cells, you're going to obviously have to copy all of your proteins, you're going to have to duplicate them, you're going to have to have enough protein for both cells. Okay, so if you can't synthesize new proteins, you can't divide in two. So that's why the macrolide, macrolide antibiotics are all bacteria static, and in fact all um, antibiotics that work by blocking protein synthesis are bacteria static rather than bacteria. Bactericidal. Okay, right, so what we're going to do in this video, the structure of this video, is we're going to look at the process of translation, we're going to have a bit of a revision of our molecular biology, uh, and then we'll look at how the macrolide antibiotics block translation. And you might say, well, why on earth, after you've seen the detail to which I'm going to go through the process of translation in, you might say afterwards, well, why on earth was it necessary to go through all of that discussion to talk about the macrolide antibiotics, which affect the very last stage, in a way? Okay. Uh, my response to that would be, it's always good to revise your molecular biology. So, uh, what we're going to do is revise our molecular biology. So, we're going to go through the process of translation to revise our molecular biology, and then we're going to look at how the macrolide antibiotics uh, work to block translation. Okay, right, so the start of translation then, and this is translation within a bacterial cell, but the process is very, very similar in eukaryotic cells, it's just you have slightly different uh, proteins and molecules doing the translation, but the principles overlap. Okay, right, so... Um, the start of translation, then, you begin with what is known as a 30S RNA, sub, uh, well, sorry, ribosomal subunit, okay? So this here, this box that I'm drawing here, this is going to represent our 30S ribosomal subunit, okay? And this is going to make up half of the full ribosome, okay? So we haven't assembled the ribosome yet, so we have to assemble it still. So I will draw this, uh, well, I'll outline this 30S ribosomal subunit in, in this purple colour. Okay, so here is our 30S ribosomal subunit. Now, bound initially to the 30S ribosomal subunits are three initiation factors. So I'll draw these in. So here is initiation factor 1. Here is initiation factor 2. Here is initiation factor 3. And finally, there's also a molecule of GTP bound as well. So here is our guanosine triphosphate bound here. So these little boxes that I've drawn bound to the 30S ribosomal subunit, they are initiation factors. Okay, so they're little proteins that are stuck on the side of the bigger 30S ribosomal subunit. So these are initiation factors. And the one that I've specifically labelled is initiation factor 3. Okay, so I'll draw these initiation factors while I'll outline them in blue. So the initiation factors are outlined in blue. Initiation factor 2 is down here. Okay, right. And I'll also outline this guanosine triphosphate molecule in a red colour. Right, so we start off with our 30S ribosomal subunit, um, which is um, bound to these three initiation factors along with a guanosine triphosphate molecule. Now, let's bring along our piece of 
RNA which is to be transcribed. So let's say this is our piece of mRNA which we're going to transcribe. So this is mRNA. Okay, sorry, translate. This is the piece of mRNA that we're going to translate. Transcription is the process of turning DNA into a RNA code. Okay, so this piece of mRNA is going to come in and it needs to bind to this 30S ribosome or subunit. Now in D in uh, sorry, in bacteria, what you have is a certain cut selection of um, organic bases, a certain combination of organic bases, which is capable of binding to the 30S ribosome or subunit. And this uh, combination here is known as the shine dalgano sequence. This, this box that I've drawn over here, this represents the shine dalgano sequence. Now, the shine dalgano sequence is not just one sequence. There are multiple shine dalgano sequences. However, generally, they contain the uh, organic base code A G G A AGA. Okay, so uh, you usually find AGA somewhere within this shine dalgano sequence. Okay, so this shine dalgano sequence, I'll colour it in orange. This is what's going to come and bind to our 30S ribosomal subunit. Okay, so let's draw that happening. So we're going to combine our 30S ribosomal subunit with our mRNA. Also, actually, one more thing is going to come in as well. Uh, so the first RNA is also, uh, sorry, the first tRNA is also going to come in. So a little bit downstream, generally around 8 to 10 uh, organic bases downstream along the mRNA of the shine dalgano sequence, there will be the start codon. Okay, so there will be the combination of organic bases A, U, G. So remember, this is mRNA, so you don't have thymine organic bases in RNA. Instead, you have uracil. So you usually have adenine followed by uracil followed by guanine, and that is what's known as the start codon. So that tells you to start the process of translation, basically. So this is the start codon. And it will generally be around 8 to 10 organic bases downstream of the shine dalgano sequence. Okay, so what colour should I um, highlight the start codon in? I think I'll do it in turquoise. So this is the start codon in turquoise. Now, basically, the first tRNA that is going to come in and bind to this mRNA is going to have a complementary sequence of organic bases to AUG. So, if we denote this here, if um, we draw it a bigger picture, this, let's say this is the start codon here. So this is AUG on the uh, piece of mRNA here. Okay, so this is the start codon. So when I highlighted that box in turquoise here, this is what I meant. These three organic bases here, that, those are the start codon. Okay, now, on the piece of tRNA, which I will denote very simply, tRNA has a more complicated structure than this, but I will just denote it like so, like an L shape. It will have um, an anticodon, basically, which has the complementary organic bases to these organic bases of the start codon. So this is the start codon on the piece of mRNA. So on the tRNA, there is going to be the complementary sequence of organic bases to the codon, which is then known as the anticodon. Okay, now what are the complementary sequence of organic bases to AUG? Well, A it will be U, because U takes the place of thymine. Uracil takes the place of thymine. For uracil, it will be A, because uracil is thymine, effectively, in RNA. So the complementary organic base is A. And for guanine, it's cytosine. Okay, so basically, you will bring in one of these tRNA molecules. So this is a piece of tRNA for transfer RNA. That's what transfer sta uh, tRNA stands for. Okay. <coughs> So this is a piece of transfer RNA. Okay, so the transfer RNA will come in and it will have an amino acid joined to it that will be specific to this anticodon it has. So tRNAs, they all have different anticodons here. And the amino acid that they have attached to them is specific to what combination of organic bases they have in their anticodon. Now, 
this tRNA, which has the complementary uh, anticodon, so the start codon, has an amino acid known as formylmethionine. Formylmethionine attached to it. Okay, now formylmethionine is actually a modified amino acid. Methionine is the amino acid. Formyl is a slightly mo slight modification of it. And so let me just show you this. Let me show you firstly the structure of methionine and then what I mean by formyl methionine. So let's draw the basic amino acid structure. So here's our amino group up here. Okay. Here's the alpha carbon. Here's the carboxylic acid group down here. Okay. A hydrogen coming off the alpha carbon. And then also off the alpha carbon, you have the R group of methionine, which is two methylene groups like so. One, two, okay, and then a sulfur atom here, and then a methyl group off the end here. So that is the structure of methionine. Now, the way in which you attach the methionine to uh, the tRNA, you attach it via this carboxylic acid group. So the carboxylic acid group here is attached to uh, the tRNA. That's how you attach this amino acid to the tRNA, okay? So that means this amino group is free, basically. It's over here, maybe. It's on this side. So this carboxylic acid group is down here, involved in the attachment to the tRNA, whereas the amino group is free to have other things bound to it. And what's it, what it's going to have bound to it is a formal group. So formic acid, then. Formic acid is what would now be called methanoic acid. So it's basically the one carbon carboxylic acid. So this is formic acid or methanoic acid. Okay? And basically, when we talk about formal methionine, we mean where you have taken formic acid and bound it to this amino group in an amide link. So, formal methionine, let me draw it fully out for you here. You have this amino group now involved in this um, amide link with formic acid here. So, this is the formal group stuck onto that amino group of the methionine. Then you have the alpha carbon still with its hydrogen attached and the R group of methionine here. Okay, so here's this methyl group off the end of the sulfur atom. And here are the hydrogens of these methylene groups in between, the um, alpha carbon and the sulfur atom. And here is the carboxylic acid group, which will be involved in the attachment to the tRNA molecule. Okay, right. Uh, so, that whole structure, i.e. the tRNA, with this complementary anticodon to the start codon, along with the formal methionine attached to it, is then known as an F met tRNA, okay? So an F met tRNA is just standing for formal methionine tRNA. Okay, right. So what's going to happen is you're going to bind this mRNA to the 30S ribosomal subunit. When you do that, the Schein-Dalgano sequence will bind to the 30S ribosomal subunit, okay? And at this, just after that, what will happen is the... Um, the formal methionine tRNA will bind uh, with the start codon of your mRNA, basically. So, what you will assemble is this 30S ribosomal subunit, which we'll draw here, okay, with the mRNA bound here, okay, and with this formal methionine tRNA, with this methionine, oh, well, this formal methionine off the end here. So, we'll colour in formal methionine in this blue colour, so this blue dot here, this represents now a formal methionine amino acid. Okay, and um, then um, in this process of combining all of them together in this way, uh, what happens is initiation factor three here breaks off. So now all you have left is initiation factor one here, initiation factor two here and a guanosine triphosphate molecule. Okay, so the initiation factor three has gone, basically. So let me color these in. So, in purple, we have um, the 30S ribosomal subunit. Okay, uh, in blue, we have the, initi oops, the initiation factor one, 
and the initiation factor 2. Okay, and in red here, we have the guanosine triphosphate molecule. Okay, finally, let's also outline where the start codon is and where the shine dalgano sequence is on this mRNA. So here's the start codon uh, bound to now this anticodon on the formalmethionine tRNA. And over here somewhere will be the shine dalgano sequence in orange. Right, so... This structure that we have now created is what is known as the 30S, uh, the 30S pre-initiation complex. Pre-initi... Ooh, dear, this is going to go wrong. Pre-initiation... Ooh, there, it just fitted in. Wasn't that amazing? Pre-initiation complex. Right, okay. So, uh, we'll call it there for this video, and then we'll discuss in the next video how we proceed from here.